All right. Uh, so welcome to the workshop. This is Interactive Control for Live Performance, just to make sure everybody's in the correct workshop. Uh, my name is Ginger Lee. I create under the name Synthestruct. I work with a lot of dis different sensors. I do a lot of audiovisual work, interactive work, um, full dome performances, uh, pretty much anything that allows me to mesh together all the different things I love playing with. So today we're going to be talking about creative ways to use different sensors for live performance. That also translates to using different sensors for interactive installations. So it does apply to other areas. Um, we're going to be talking about the control aspect of using sensors. So um, basically creating works that you want to be able to control certain parameters of it in real time. So that's what we're going to be focusing on. Um, there is the demo file that has some examples that are pretty basic examples of the, the visualization so that we have things to practice mapping to. Um, but once you get into the actual aesthetics of everything, of course, that's a whole world beyond the interactive part that connects to it and then figuring out how you want to do the aesthetics and how you want to work with it. So my goal today is to have each and every one of you have a project in mind that you want to work with and have an idea of how to be able to connect sensors to it and the whole pipeline that you would do to be able to uh, make that happen. Um, so just a really quick bit about myself, uh, since I'm going to be probably mentioning and referencing certain projects. Um, so my name is Synthostruct, is uh, the creative name that I work under. Um, I, as I mentioned, I do a lot of interactive experiences. So recently I did a dome performance with the uh, Mimu gloves, which is the gloves I'm wearing. So I'm not just wearing like weird gloves for no reason. Um, so these are the Mimu gloves, they're sensor enabled gloves. Um, so during the dome performance, I was con controlling all of the audio and visuals live with the, the gloves. So basically it allowed me to be as a conductor in the middle of the dome where I didn't need to touch my laptop. I was completely um, away from it. And I could basically just through gestures and hand movements compose all of the audio and visual in real time. Um, I set it up so that everything was very flexible so I could make decisions in the moment how I wanted everything to unfold and basically be able to play within these different scenes. Um, and so that's something I'm going to be talking about examples of like how to map different things and how to think about uh, different things that you want to control and the best way to set up that pipeline. Um, so here's some more pictures of that. Um, I've also worked with, for example, the Muse headset, uh, which is an EEG headset. This was an interactive installation, but it's also a sensor that you get data from. Um, also worked with, we have the Leap Motion here, uh, MIDI controllers, 3D mouse. So we're going to be going over a lot of different things today uh, and examples of how to connect that. Um, a lot of you guys responded to the email that I sent out, the little questionnaire thing. So I know quite a bit about most of you guys. This workshop is going to be very custom tailored to the people that are here taking the workshop because I want you guys to get the most out of it. So that's why I've been walking around and seeing what you guys brought with you, um, getting to know a little bit about your background and what you guys are interested in doing. Um, and we're going to do a little exercise in just a second where I want you guys to start thinking about a project that you want to work on, a real life project, so that you don't have just this big idea, but you actually have a project that you want to um, figure out the pipeline of how to get that to work. Um, really quick, if you guys go over to the um, notes on sensors, I'm going to go through this. I know it is a lot of text, so it's not as exciting as the uh, visual stuff. So we're just going to kind of go through this really quickly. Um, the reason that I wanted to give you guys these notes is because there's a lot of um, terms I'm going to be using and a lot of ways that I'm going to be talking about sensors. So I wanted to just kind of give an overview of the different types of control that I'm going to be talking about at different points. Um, so you don't have to read through it verbatim. This is just so you guys have it. Um, so every sensor has different possibilities of how you can use it. So um, certain sensors are basically just buttons. Certain sensors give you a whole range of values that you can work with. So a lot of terms that I'm going to be using to compare the functionality of different uh, sensors is a trigger, which is basically a very quick on and off. Um, and people are shaking their heads. Like some of this that I go over, a lot of you guys are like, this is elementary, like we know what a trigger is, but not everybody does. So today, um, and actually Nora and I were just talking about this the other day, is about filling in some of the gaps in people's knowledge. Because a lot of people, um, when they ask questions about how to set up the pipeline for interactive control, they know bits and pieces of it, but there's a lot of chunks that are, are missing. So today is more about being a comprehensive overview of how to approach it and also um, different creative ideas of maybe thinking of things that, that you didn't think that you could work with for live control. 
Um, so a trigger is basically a very quick and on and off. So from zero to one and back to zero very quickly. A toggle is switching between the two. So switching to on, you press a button, switches off, press a button, switches on. Uh, velocity or sensing um, is basically getting values of, for example, if you press a button, detecting how hard you're pressing that button. So it's an additional value that goes along with the, uh, the button press or the toggle or the trigger um, that you can use to map to other things. So it's basically telling you how hard you're pressing a button. Um, control values, so this is uh, something we're going to be talking a lot. So control values are continuously variable values, such as, for example, um, if I'm using a gyroscope, then the control values would be the continually changing values of the x, y, and z axes. Um, and then selector, um, these are basically all ones that I use to describe things. So a selector is um, a very specific type of um, toggle or trigger that allows you to enter a certain state. So for example, um, if I make this gesture, that's a selector that says, OK, when I make this gesture, I want to control this parameter. But when I'm not making that gesture, I don't want that parameter to listen to what I'm doing. So it's basically a way of selecting different parts of uh, what you want to control and then allowing access to uh, that parameter to listen to it. Um, so we're going to go through the different controllers. We're going to go through the different controllers uh, individually. So we'll go ahead and hop over to the uh, demo file. So for the MIDI controller one, um, I set up some very simple visuals. I think it's a little bit more beneficial for us to go over a file that's already created rather than me create an op and then wait for you guys to create it and then set parameters and wait for you guys to create it, mainly because there's so many different things that we're going over today. Um, so the example file lets you guys go back and start playing with some stuff. Um, for later when you guys are going through the example file and kind of uh, switching some stuff up and looking deeper into it, um, inside each one, they're pretty much all set up the same way. Uh, whenever I create a project, I try to be very organized. So mine are always structured the same way where I have my uh, controls on the left side. Um, so all of this is going to be my channels or incoming data. Um, there's different ways to map this, but for this uh, demo, it makes sense since this is a beginner course. So everything's going to be in the same, um, same component. So everything on the left is going to be my incoming control values. Um, and then I set up all my visuals, of course, and my uh, geos in the center. And then everything going out to the right is going to be my uh, post-render editing. And we'll dive a little bit deeper into that in a second. Um, but the reason I mentioned that is underneath the uh, tips. So in some of the examples, there is a uh, text file that has additional links to other things that you can check out. So additional uh, blog posts or additional videos that you can watch that will explain how to do stuff. Um, so I'm going to walk you guys through setting up a MIDI controller. So how many of you guys brought MIDI controllers with you? A couple of you guys? OK. Um, as I mentioned, I'm kind of catering this towards like what's going to be beneficial to everybody. So I'm just going to walk through this, um, but there are certain parts that could go more in depth that we're just kind of going to mention and gloss over. Um, so for setting up the MIDI, do I have mine plugged in? Um, if you want to follow along, so double click. And there's a couple different MIDI devices that we have access to. So we're going to start with the uh, MIDI in chop. OK, so the MIDI in Chop, um, if you guys have a MIDI controller, you may not have anything showing up. If you don't have a MIDI controller, then of course, just follow along and watch. Um, what's going to happen, in order for Touch Designer to recognize your MIDI controller, um, you have to go to Dialogs and MIDI Device Mapper. So let me go ahead and I'm going to delete that. So if you're first setting it up, you're not going to have anything here. So I want to create a new mapping. And when you do that, then you're going to have three different columns, so the in device, out device, and the MIDI map. If you click the drop down arrow for in device, 
Oh, mine actually showed up. You might have a whole list of uh, stuff here, maybe not. Um, so hopefully if you have yours plugged in and you installed any drivers or anything that you need for it, um, it should show up in the list. And the out device, uh, we're not doing any output MIDI, but we'll go ahead and choose that. And for the MIDI map, chances are yours is not gonna be in the list here. There are some that are already in the list. So if yours is, great, awesome. If not, then what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, go to our devices. So we have device mappings, and then right next to that we have devices. And I'm going to add a device. And right here where, so we just created the new device, so it has a generic user device map name. You can go ahead and click on that. And go ahead and give it whatever name you want. I already have an Arturia, but I'll just do two. Okay. All right, and then once you've added that, then we can go to device mappings. And then under our MIDI map, you should have that down at the bottom to select. Okay, and before you close the window, you can test and twirl some knobs, push some buttons and see if it's showing up. If anybody who has a MIDI controller, if it's not working for you, let me know. Um, it's, oh, it's sending OSC. So we'll be doing that part in just a second. Yeah, the MIDI controller would be connected to your computer. Did anybody want me to pause there? Let's see. So you are going to, which one do you have? This one? OK. So did you install drivers that you need for it? Yeah. No, let's see, nothing's happening. You have it plugged in, right? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, let's see this, because we're gonna um, kind of after each center take a little break, so I will come back and see if we can get that working. All right, so once that's set up, and then you should have some incoming values. Um, so taking a look at the values that we have to work with, as I mentioned, every sensor is gonna give you different options of things to play with. So mine, for example, I have buttons, I have rotary knobs, and I have, actually that's pretty much it. Um, in terms of recommending a MIDI controller, to be honest, um, I like sliders. This one travels well because it's smaller. The other one that I have is much bigger and it's really a pain to travel with. Um, but if you have knobs, before you buy a MIDI controller, think about the things that you want in a MIDI controller. So for example, like these knobs, if you can look at uh, the bottom value here, if I'm doing a live show, for me to try and smoothly transition with this knob is not gonna happen. I could put a filter, but even so, like I don't know if you can see how many times I'm trying to rotate this knob to get the full spectrum of it. Um, so when you're looking for a MIDI controller, there's a lot of different things to think about. Um, so I like sliders because they are a lot smoother. Um, this does have the uh, velocity sensitive, so you can see the uh, aftertouch. So as I press the button, it's pressing it and you can see it's detecting how hard I'm, I'm pressing the button. And actually I have it mapped to a couple of different ones. Um, so I have this set up so that when I'm pressing this one, this one, yeah, this one. So it's actually, you can see as it's sliding, the harder that I press is adjusting the amplitude of the noise. So if I'm doing this in a live setting, I can actually um, you know, go along with the beat of the music and determine how hard I want to press it. So this gives me a lot of flexibility for literally playing along with it. So this isn't automated, it's me literally playing along and determining you know, how I wanna play with the beat and kind of determining in real time what the music uh, should look like visually. Um, 
let's see, other things. So to map this, once you have all these showing up as a uh, channel, then um, the reason that I put the text link over here um, under the tips is because um, this is a series of four different videos that actually walks you through saving out your MIDI map so that once you um, go through in the MIDI map dialogues that we just had, so here, um, when you go to devices, you can actually rename all of these um, and save it out as something that makes sense because chances are these aren't going to make sense. So when you look at it, you know exactly what they mean. Um, so the link that I gave you uh, is by Matthew Reagan, who I'm sure most of you guys know, that will actually walk you through the process of saving out the MIDI map. So since not everybody brought a MIDI controller today, I'm not going to walk you guys through that whole process because you won't be able to follow along with that. Um, but when you do have your MIDI controller, I recommend going through and actually saving the MIDI map so that you have naming conventions that makes a lot of sense for you to go back and work with later. So for today, I have things like uh, channel 1, control 120, uh, 45. So basically, what we're going to do today is just um, uh, select the channels that we want to work with and then uh, go from there. I already went through this process, so you guys don't have to sit and watch me do this, um, just to give you an example. So here's my incoming data. And then um, to map it, then way up here, apparently. Hold on. Let's see. Um, so I have it mapped out so that I have all of my knobs selected um, and then uh, isolating what I want to be uh, changing the uh, geo T, X, and Y, and then isolating other things. So basically with this whole process, what I'm doing is figuring out what I want to control and what process I want to control it by. Um, so we're going to do our little uh, imagination exercise in just a second. But basically, that's the whole uh, bread and butter of figuring out the interaction is thinking, what do I want to control? And by what means do I want to control it? Do I want to be pressing a button? Do I want to be doing gestures with my hands? Do I want to be uh, you know, like stepping on a pedal on the floor to control something? Uh, do I want to be using my breath to control how some parameters work? So um, that's what we're talking about today is different creative ways of exploring. How do I want to interact with it? And what's the, the actions that I want to do or not do? Um, so basically breaking these out into different components um, and then mapping it to the control. Some people are brand new to Touch Designer. Do you guys want me to go over how to map uh, controls to things? Yes? OK. We will do that. Um, so let me go ahead and like the geo. I will turn these off. Um, so to map things in Touch Designer, there's basically um, three main modes of control. Um, so if you look at any of the parameters, Parameters are controlled by numbers, which is great because that means anytime that we have a controller, as long as they were in the world of numbers, then we can have the numbers from our controllers be the numbers that control our parameters. So always think in terms of numbers, and you're good. Because if you're trying to think of like, well, how does a button become a color? It's, you can't really think about that abstract, like how does the button become a color? But if you think of the button and you think in terms of what numbers is the button generating, and if you think of color in terms of RGB values, then it's easy to figure out, okay, so I just need the numbers from this button to become the numbers that control the color values, and I might have to map it and rescale it, uh, but basically numbers also map to numbers. So we're always going to be thinking and trying to get to the land of numbers. Um, so when we go to the geo, I don't want to lose anybody. If you go to the geo, and basically what I did is I just clicked on the gray values to turn off the mapping that's already there. And so we have basically, oh, they actually, we're not going to go over the bind because that's a fairly relatively new. Um, we're going to go over the first three. So the first one, the gray one, is just hard-coded values. So whatever number that you put there, so I'll go ahead and for the translate, put something like 20. And it's going to go way off the screen. All right, so those are hard-coded values. Whatever you put there is not going to change. It's set in stone, dynamic. It's just going to stay like that until you come back and change it to something else. The second one is our uh, basically Python operator referencing. So if I wanted to, let's see, what was this coming from before? Uh, let me remind myself what it was coming from. 
GOTX. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so if I wanted to reference this GOTX, instead of having it uh, what it was before, I can type in op and then open parentheses and then controls, which is the name of my channel operator. Oh, actually, I do need quotes. Say controls. And then close parentheses. So that part so far is referencing this uh, channel operator. And then I need to tell it within the channel operator which channel I want to reference. So the TX is the first one, which makes it easy. Um, touch Designer does, basically, these are an array. Uh, the Touch Designer arrays start at 0. So I'm going to do square brackets, 0, and n square brackets. Okay. And so now that is referencing this value here. Um, if I want to copy and paste this to do the second one. So I'll paste this in here. The second value, which is going to be ty, is then going to be 1, because that is my second value in the array of uh, channels. But because such designer starts at 0, then this is actually going to be 1. Okay. Um, so we have our hard-coded values, our um, Python script. And then the third one is to export it. So to export a value, what we're going to do is Click on the plus sign. Yeah. Right? So, sorry, click on it until it's, um, you don't see the border. So, it should look like this. And then we're going to select the value that we want to use to control that parameter. <clears throat> and I'm just going to click and drag on top of the value. Let me do that one more time. Up here. And it's going to ask you what you want to do with it. And we want to export chop. Um, so basically, yeah, TX is for the first one. TY is for the second. And then uh, TZ is for the third. Mm -hmm. Sure. It is the same. <clears throat> so yeah, no, it's not. Definitely not. Um, great question. So I wouldn't necessarily um, set this up this way for live performance. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about optimization. Mainly the reason that I set it up this way is to give you guys an opportunity later um, with the controllers that you did bring if you wanted to remap things. Um, the constant is basically showing you different things that I do have it mapped to so that you can easily, within the constant, um, change the mappings here. And then it will go out to the other ones. Um, you can, but it's uh, basically if you have other controllers that you hook up, then it's a way of bringing those in and then just very easily seeing in one place what it uh, was mapped to. So it's just a way that I set it up for you guys so that you can see things that are being controlled in the. So, any other questions on the. Um, yeah. Uh, I have kind of a Actually, to be honest, I haven't used binding yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, because I had the previous version of Touch Designer, and then I just never played around with uh, the binding since I updated to 2019. If I'm being totally honest, yeah, I haven't played with the binding yet. So unfortunately, that one I can't answer. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? No? OK. So. Um, so that is how we map stuff, because we're going to be doing a lot of mapping. And all right, so let's see, anything else with the MIDI stuff? Um, so before we move on to, so my personal, 
take on that is that I do like using Python expressions because they are very specific. Um, I find that if I'm constantly changing how I'm mapping stuff um, and I'm redragging and redragging and redragging, um, sometimes Touch Designer doesn't like that. And so I do find that hard coding it is better. And ultimately, I think moving towards doing more Python work is the way to go. Um, because like I was saying before, where like I wouldn't necessarily set it up this way. There's other ways of doing like extensions and other things where if you're doing large scale performances and you have all these different operators and everything communicating, it becomes a really uh, uh, taxing project that's going to be using a lot of resources, then I think ultimately moving more and more towards doing Python and, uh, and scripting everything is going to be the, the way to go. Um, I mean, I do export a lot of stuff, um, but if you're constantly re-exporting and re-exporting and re-exporting, then sometimes you have to delete the operator and then just do it again because it might get, it tends to not forget if you like 20 times, like ch keep changing it. So yeah, so I think hard coding it sometimes is, is the best way to go. Any other questions on exporting? Any other stuff? Okay. All right. Um, so what I want to do, because we're going to um, basically go over, so we have the MIDI map, we have the Leap Motion, we have other sensors that we're going over. Um, so we're going to do a little uh, imagination exercise for just a second. So what I want you guys to do is think about a project, a real life project. It can be very imaginative, but something specific that you guys are interested in creating that you can interact with. It can be you, or it can be a client, or it can be uh, somebody outside yourself. It could be a dancer. It could be a ballet troupe. So I want you to think about what kind of project would you be interested in working and adding live control to? And <laughs> I'm going to ask more questions. So if you're shaking your head at that point, so think, is it going to be you doing it? Are you the performer? Or would you be controlling it or creating it for somebody else? So maybe you're creating interactive visuals for a band that's touring. Looking at Cyrus. <laughs> so maybe you're creating visuals for a band. Maybe you are doing a performance in a dome. Maybe you're actually not interested in live performance, but you like sensors for doing an interactive installation. Maybe that one. Okay. So, so think about this installation or the live performance and think, so are you the one who's doing the main uh, interaction or are there groups of people coming up and interacting with it if it's an a interactive installation? Okay. And think about what do you want them to control? So are they controlling visuals? Are they controlling sound? Are they controlling lights that are coming down from the ceiling? Are they controlling the movement of platforms that robots are controlling music, which are also controlling lights and waving those around? There's no limit to it. So try to think in your mind, what do you want to be able to dynamically control? Okay. Everybody have that? Yeah? Okay. So now that you know what is going to be controlled, think what is the mechanism by which you want them to control it? Not necessarily the controller yet. So we're not just a specific controller, but is there somebody doing a performance? And it's part of this whole elaborate performance where somebody's doing these grand gestures and then something's being controlled in real time behind them. And there's fireworks that go off every time that they you know, raise their hand above a certain point. Or are you visualizing the movements of dancers? Or are you, let's see, let's take it back to something completely different. So if you're doing live performance for a band, uh, is it audio reactive? Do you want the band... Uh, because they're going to be playing, so you might have to think about what they're already doing with their hands. And do you have somebody separate on stage controlling the visuals, or do you want the visuals to somehow be integrated into their performance where they're already doing stuff with their instruments? So maybe the instruments are somehow linked to the visuals. Okay. So do you guys have an idea of, so you know what they're controlling, right? So we got that part. Do you know, have in your head what you want them to do or what you want to do to control it? How many of you guys are controlling it yourself? 
No, we, we don't have a lot of performers there. Maybe. How many of you guys would be doing it for another band or like a different client? Okay. Client, right? Okay. All right. So you guys have this idea in your head of what you want to do, right? Because we're going to be going through a lot of different examples. And by the end, I want you guys to have in mind exactly how you would be able to make that a reality. It might take tons of servers and be a much bigger project, but in terms of the interaction part and the control, uh, that's what I want you guys to think about. Um, so Leap Motion, we'll go over relatively quickly. Um, do I have it? Yeah, I do have it plugged in. I'm going to move back my MIDI controller as we shift here. So Leap Motion, have any of you guys interacted with it, played with it, used it for anything? Have you interacted with it for your own stuff or like at installations and has everybody at least like like done something with it, whether it's like a museum or anything that you so they've been used a lot for, for interactive experiences, which I think they do work well for um, installations. Um, and the reason why is because, so basically um, they're great for hand interaction. It's not quite as cool as the Kinect. You can't like map a full body or anything like that, but it does work with hand gestures. So similar to the Kinect, you have the infrared light, uh, which is measuring the distance of the hand. So basically uh, the light is detecting the amount of time it takes for it to bounce back. And so it can detect the distance of your hand. Um, the cool thing about going from the MIDI controller to the uh, Leap Motion is we're now going into three-dimensional space. So with the MIDI controller, if I wanted to control something in three-dimensional space, which touch, touch designer is great for, right? Because it's obviously 3D space. Um, if I wanted to control 3D space with the MIDI controller with two hands, it becomes a little bit cumbersome because then I'm trying to like, I mean, you can kind of, like I've gotten kind of good at like basically half hold a knob while holding another and somehow control three knobs at the same time. You can do that, but it's not necessarily intuitive. So the cool thing about the Leap Motion is that you're now working in three-dimensional space because you have literally three axes where when you move your hand, um, you have one axis, the other axis, and then and forward and back is the other. So if I have that mapped to um, controlling my geo, for example, let's see, did I set it up in this one? I don't remember if I ended up doing the XYZ. Yep, so there's the TXTY controls. Let's see if I did it. Maybe not. Um, so I'll get to the control part in just a second because it might not, I might have to unplug it. Um, so basically the way that I have set up theoretically that should be working right now um, is so I have the uh, movement of my figure here mapped to the um, other oh, rotations working, but uh, mapped to the movement of my hand. So basically I can map those three axes to uh, move the object around in three dimensional space. And when we take a break, I'll, I'll fix that in a second because I want to keep talking um, instead of fixing that right now. Um, but the interesting thing about it, so talking about different possibilities of what we can do with sensors, because all of the different options that they have, so the different axes that they give us, um, if there's gesture control, which just does have pretty basic gesture control, um, that is all options of how we can map different stuff and how we can create creatively different interaction with things. So with the leap motion, what I have is the three axes, but also basic gesture control. So as we talked about with the um, example earlier, I can use different gestures to create basically an on-off mechanism. And so um, let's see, it was working when I set it up. Let's see if it's even coming in. Um, so what I ended up doing was unplug it and plug it back in, um, setting it up so that I wanted to be able to um, control the noise. I wouldn't necessarily do this exact thing in a live setting, but let's say I wanted to be able to control the amplitude of the noise. But um, the thing that's weird about sensors is so like, let's say I was adjusting it. And then the second that I get distracted, and I kind of look away for a second. If I move my hand, this is going to jump back to whatever values it was originally at. So um, with the leap motion is tricky. I don't necessarily recommend it for live performance. Great for, for installations. Um, the three dimensional space aspect is great, but the downside is it has to be within range and detect your hand. So the second that you pull it out of that range, then it, it drops out and you're no longer sending data to it. Um, so what I did, oh, there we go. Okay, so the way that I set it up, um, just to show you guys the example, is let's say that I wanted to be able to control something with the leap motion, but I wanted to be able to, 
adjust it and then leave it at the value that it's at. So I set up the, um, the pinch, as you can see here. And actually, I'll show you where it's coming from. So when I bring in the leap motion, did anybody bring in leap motion with them? Oh, cool. OK. So um, if you bring in a leap motion chop, there is tons and tons of data that, that comes in, right? Um, mine is set on the version 2 tracking. Um, I can work with you individually because the tracking is kind of weird between uh, different versions of the leap motion. Um, and so I do have the gestures turned on and the pinch strength. And so you can see, uh, let's see, the pinch. I only have it set to one hand. There we go. So um, let me put my cursor right there so you can see it. So the pinch with this hand, when I'm doing this gesture, so it's a very specific gesture, then it's basically uh, triggering for as long as I'm holding that, it's going to register that I'm pinching. It's a little bit noisy, but basically it can detect that I'm making a pinch gesture. So I have selected that separately so I can do something with it apart from uh, everything else. So these are just my pinches, my, my left hand and my right hand. Boop. OK, so making a pinch gesture. Right. Um, and after like kind of troubleshooting, it does like when you make it very obvious that your hand is open because if you're doing like this, it gets a little confused. Like it still thinks I'm doing a pinch, which I'm clearly not. So it helps when you have your hands open because sometimes things trying to recognize gestures, you got to imagine they're not the best. They're not the smartest. So you have to make it super obvious that the rest of your fingers are not part of the, the gesture. So super obvious that it's open, and then do the, the pinch gesture. So what I can do with that is then um, I have that going through. And I'm also using, basically, alongside doing the pinch gesture, I'm bringing in the, uh, the height data of my hand, which is the uh, TY value. So it's the distance of my palm. Right, And I have that going through a math to rescale it and then a limit to basically uh, restrict the values. And the key to it is using the hold. So basically, I have the hold on this value so that if you watch uh, what's happening with the pinch. So when I do the pinch value, what it does is it sends a one value to the second input of the hold. And so then when it's uh, open, so it's like a gate, so when it's a 1, the gate is open, and the values can flow through. So now I can, when I raise my hand up, increase the amplitude of the noise. I can lower my hand, and it's going to turn the noise all the way off. I can raise my hand up. And so because it's a gated system, if I then let go and open my hand, then I can leave it like that. So when it's closed, I can then keep changing the value, and it's going to be listening. So basically, when the gate's open, it's a listener. And then when I open and leave it, then it's going to stay like that. So that, that kind of idea is, can be very important, because a lot of times when you're setting up interactive control, you basically want to open the gate for something to listen to incoming data, but then you want to be able to close the gate with that. So when I was doing the uh, Mimu Glove performance, pretty much almost everything that I did was based on that idea of when I wanted to control one thing, then it would be uh, dictated by a certain gesture that I'm making. So when I'd make a gesture, it meant, OK, I I'm targeting this specific thing that I want to control. And then any movement that I did with my hand with the uh, x, y, and z axis could be mapped to control that specific parameter. So basically, the different gestures would be used to indicate the different things I wanted to control. And then that would turn on the gate for the uh, values to flow into that parameter. And then when I would do a different gesture, then I would be targeting something else. Um, and without being able to do that, then uh, during the live performance, there was so many things uh, being mapped and controlled at the same time that without being able to specifically isolate through the gestures what I wanted to control, um, then it would just be utter, utter chaos. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So the question is, um, why would I use the Mimu gloves versus the Leap Motion? Um, so basically, there is a huge difference. So um, we're kind of like working up in scale. So the MIDI controller is like the, the base, like there's buttons and everything, and which is great. Uh, the Leap Motion, we're starting to get into three dimensions. Um, with the gloves, so if you guys aren't familiar with them, so they have uh, flex sensors in the hands. So the flex sensors can detect what I'm doing with my fingers. And so that can be used to detect when I'm doing certain gestures that I can uh, do mappings to. Um, and then there's also uh, IMU. Uh, which is an inertial measurement unit, which detects, it's basically an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a magnetometer all in one. Um, so that gives me information about the position of my hands in three-dimensional space, um, which also, of course, produces three dimensions of data that I can map to certain things. Um, so the question of, like, why would I use the gloves? So the reason that the gloves are really great for doing things like uh, touch designer uh, and interactive control and being able to step away from the computer is because each of these sensors is basically possibilities. So when I look at working with different sensors, I look at what are the possibilities of working with the sensor? You know, what are the possibilities for gating it? What are the possibilities for targeting what I want to work with? What are the individual channels? Or we had talked about in the beginning, the um, control values. So how many different uh, dimensions of control values are there? Um, so with the gloves, the main thing that I use to uh, map to different parameters is the X, Y, and Z axis, which doesn't have to relate to spatial data. It's basically three channels of data that I can use to control things. So um, thinking non-spatially, if we work in a color space, um, then I could map the three axes to my RGB values, and then I have the entire gamut of any color that I want to navigate through in three-dimensional space. So, so I'm not using it to literally map space to space. I'm using it to navigate Exactly, a color space. Um, I could also use it to only use the uh, TX value to control, to control, let's say, the amplitude. I can use it to control literally anything because it's a streaming, continuously streaming uh, values that are coming in. And I can use it literally for any parameter in Touch Designer um, that has a number as an input. Of course, I clicked on the one thing that doesn't, uh, that has a number as an input. So I have streaming numbers those would map to control anything that also has streaming numbers. Um, you might need to, of course, use a map chop to change the range of it. Yeah. Um, and so with the, the way that the gloves are set up, um, they do come with their proprietary software, which has um, the ability to program different gestures, which is great. So basically, like I can program, this is me making a pinch hand. This is me doing a one finger point. This is me doing a two finger point. This is me doing a three finger point. Um, and then I can even get creative with doing like, you know, one pinking out or something. I don't know. So different gestures. Um, so I can program those gestures through doing it multiple times and comparing, here's a, here's a turning a knob. Here's a one finger point. Here's a turning a knob or pinch. Here's a one finger point. And so it learns those gestures. And so then I can use those to map to other things. So um, since we're on the topic of, of Mimu gloves, um, I'll just give you guys like a really quick uh, the setup of how I used it during the live show. So um, the software that connects to the glove data is only for Mac. Uh, so during the live performance, I had the gloves. Uh, everything was co connected to the same uh, local area network. So basically, the gloves send data wirelessly uh, to the Mac laptop. Um, and then in the Glover software, then I create all of the OSC messages, which we'll talk about OSC in just a second, uh, the OSC and MIDI messages that are going to be outgoing. And uh, half of those messages were to control the audio, which was also on the Mac. And then half of them were to control Touch Designer, which was on a separate computer on a PC. Um, so the OSC data was sent wirelessly to the PC. Um, so I had to use OSC for that. So I had messages being sent to the same computer and then externally, um, and everything was mapped uh, within Touch Designer to control stuff. So, um, so we can definitely talk more about, about the gloves yeah, for sure, because there's a lot of um, mappings and, and different. Uh... Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically uh, uh, set up so that uh, within Glover, they, they already have it set up so that you just do the gestures and you say, I want to program this gesture. And then you make the different gestures. And then, yeah, and then you can. Um, no, not for that part. No, yeah. Um, the other programming is outside of once you send the messages to an external program, then then using it there. Um, yeah, so it's really uh, intuitive to use that aspect of it. Yeah. Question. <laughs>
Um, so they just did their second round of uh, shipping out the gloves. Uh, don't quote me on the price because I don't remember. I want to say they're 2000 Yeah, and I know they're already sold out. They just did their second round of, of uh, sending them out, basically, because it had been a couple years since, since this version, uh, and then they just created more, and then those sold out within, like, a couple days, and then they're shipping them out, I think, like, right now, this week. Yeah. But I got to say, after using these, trying to go back to using a MIDI controller is really hard <laughs> because it is really nice like once you set up the whole system to be able to respond to your movements to be able to just do everything very intuitively and, and freely um, the difference of course being like you know leap motion like you have to be very specifically in front of it and then as soon as you go out of it it's no longer listening and it's a much different feeling as a performer when you're actually it's a part of you and you're controlling everything as opposed to you performing for a device that's listening to your gestures. So when it's actually a part of you, it's it's a totally different feeling. Yeah, completely, yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Um, I think they're going to produce more of the latest version. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, but we'll also talk about, I guess we could talk about now. So, um, if you guys are interested in doing like some DIY stuff, so the gloves, I mean, they're they're really, really well made. So I do, they're awesome. I highly recommend them. Um, I've been playing with some uh, DIY because basically it's a it's an IMU. Um, and so there are other ways to get gyroscope data. For example, like we'll start like at the very, very basic, like um, I've taught workshops where, you know, we're just using the gyroscope and mapping through OSC. So actually on your phone, um, so, Touch OSC allows you to use accelerometer data, which is not gyroscope. So accelerometer measures uh, how quickly you're moving something. And so like an inertial, uh, you know, it can detect like if you're moving left, right, up, down, uh, three axes, but it only detects how quickly you're moving. The gyroscope data is the positional data. And so gyroscope is really nice for actually mapping three-dimensional space. Um, so in Touch OSC, they have currently the accelerometer data and I sent them an email to say that they need to add the gyroscope data because it would be super helpful. Because um, once you have that, basically you can just use your phone as a controller and you could literally basically just like strap your phone to your hand and use that as a three-dimensional controller. So if you wanted to do an easy hack, I mean, that's like one way that you can do it. Um, so presently they don't have the gyroscope data, but they do have the accelerometer. So if you wanted to just explore the idea of, of movement through using some kind of spatial data or at least, you know, uh, how quickly you're moving, then you could do that. Um, there's also other um, IMUs that you can get. I have, uh, there's like the micro bit, which I actually haven't played with yet, but um, I want to say the the mini Mew gloves that they have for kids it uses the micro bit. Um, so that's also something to play around with to explore. Yeah, yeah, which is definitely great. Um, but a lot of, um, so if you're into doing a lot of DIY stuff, so one of the great things about the gloves is that it does come with the proprietary software that they spent a lot of time making work with the gloves really, really well to map everything. Because um, you can get flex sensors and, you know, like an Arduino and, you know, set up your own. But the thing with sensors is, um, so it's analog, which means that, like, eventually it needs to be converted to digital. But with analog sensors, they can be very noisy. You also, you know, have to make sure that, uh, you know, everything is wired correctly and stuff. So um, mostly the noise factor. So if you get the flex sensors working, then you could definitely go that route, but just know that there's gonna be like a, a lot of trial and error and actually making sure that the that you get a clean signal. So that's the nice thing is getting a clean signal. Cause if you don't get a clean signal and it's all over the place, then you're gonna have a lot of time just even trying to figure out and make sense of the data that's coming in and where the noise is coming from and yeah. yeah. Any other questions on the like, gloves and IMUs or anything before we go on to? No? All right. Mm -hmm. 
So my honest thoughts on it, I think the Leap Motion works great for interactive installations. Um, for a live performance, um, there is, there's, you know, a cool aspect of it, like performing and being able to wave your hand and, and do things with it. But if you're, if people aren't going to actually be seeing what you're doing, you know, if you're just behind like a VJ booth or something and you're like, oh, I just want to have a really cool control, um, I wouldn't rely on it being the best intuitive control because like I was saying, like if your hand comes over here, suddenly it's going to fall back to whatever it was doing. So, um, and you saw even when I was doing the pinching and stuff, it's not 100% reliable. So like the buttons are reliable. Like if I push a button, it knows I'm pushing the button. So, um, my personal take on it is, um, MIDI controllers are great because they're very definitive as to what you're doing. Like it's super obvious. The controller knows what I'm doing, um, especially if you have sliders. Um, you know, they're much smoother than the knobs. Um, the only reason that I would recommend the Leap Motion is uh, exploring three dimensional space and getting an idea of how hand gestures can be used as kind of an entry into that. The gloves are like a on crack version of that, basically. So, um, yeah, so that would be my take on it is unless you're doing something performative with it, um, I would go with something like a MIDI controller for more reliability. There we go. Okay, so we're just going to stick with the live. I don't know why the SDK doesn't want to play nice right now, probably because we're in the middle of a workshop. Um, so we're going to stick with the live data. Um, so to answer your question, if you look at the chop, we have <laughs> way more data than we could ever possibly need. Like you, you can barely even zoom in and look at the names of the channels here. So we can parse this data out and select what we want from it. So if I do a select, and then I can use pattern matching, so um, let's say that I just do, uh, let's say that I want my hand tips, right? So I can just type in uh, hand tip. And for those of you guys that aren't familiar with pattern matching, so our asterisk basically is like a wild card. So if I do a uh, wild card, hand tip, wild card, it means that just give me anything that has the word hand tipped, anything, anything can come before it, and then the word hand tip, and then anything can come after it. So that allows me to select, for example, um, player one, or if there was player two, I could still select it. And then there's all this stuff after it. So it's also going to select that. If I didn't have that there, then it's not going to be able to do it because there's nothing that just ends in hand tip without anything after it. So you can add the wild card and then that helps you, helps you search for it. Um, so then you would be able to send the OSC uh, data. I'm not going to do it right now because we have like all these examples that I want to jump into at least really quickly, um, but you would be able to do the OSC out like we were doing before. So if you had, um, which is common, if you have a big show and you have one computer that's running everything and then you have another computer on the other end of the, the venue that needs to be receiving the data. Um, so actually I wouldn't necessarily send large amounts of data over OSC. There's a lot of other ways to do it. But if you're, for example, like if you're right by your computer and you're interacting with a device like your phone or the gloves or anything else and you just want to send OSC data to something that's right there, then yeah, it works. Sending it over Ethernet. <laughs> it depends on the scale of the project. Yeah. Uh, you would send out the data. It depends like what you're sending basically. But if you send Ethernet, then it's going to be a lot faster and more secure. So it really depends on the scope of what you're doing. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's jump in the stuff, and then if we have time, we'll come back to it, because it's very much like a case scenario and the scale of the project and what you want to send back and forth. But yeah, so OSC is good for relative amounts of data that are, are manageable on a smaller scale. <clears throat> um, so if we jump into the... Uh, this one. Oh, masking the connect with player. So we'll go through this kind of quickly. Um, I basically just wanted to give you guys some examples of different stuff that you can do with the um, connect. So down here, basically, all of these are pulling from the upper level. So here's all of the individual um, uh, images coming in. And then in each of these, basically, I'm selecting the ones that I want to use for it. So in the uh, masking the person, basically, I have the 
uh, player index. And the thing that's great about the player index, so what it does, zooming way in here, is basically, yeah, once it identifies a, that there's a person there, then it will create a grayscale image outline of the person, which, as you can imagine, is good for masking things. Um, it's kind of hit or miss because you can see it's a bit noisy. Like, I'm zoomed way in. You're pretty far away, but it's relatively pixelated. Um, and with some of the depth, yeah, so if there's, like, um, the way that it's projected, you can see the, the black around your arm because the, the projection of the light can't reach past uh, your arm because of the perspective. So there's going to be areas that aren't there. Um, but what you can do then is uh, use that. So I just basically use the levels to convert it to a black and white image. Um, I, I know, since you're so far away. It's usually a little bit cleaner um, if you're closer. So basically, um, you use the, the black and white image, and then you can use that as a map. So what I'm doing is um, I cleaned it up a little bit. And then, let's see. So I'm using a mat to basically, this is going to be my mask. With the, the white is going to be visible. Black is going to be transparent. Um, and then I'm compositing something over it. I unplugged my MIDI controller. Um, but basically, I'm pulling in the, the background image from our previous example. So if you wanted to use the mask, I'll do a movie in. If you wanted to use the image from the player as a mask, then we'll just do banana. Video file. Ask for it. We'll just do the banana. OK. so. Here's our banana, right? Um, I have tons of other weird effects on here. Um, just for stylistic reasons, I can turn those off. OK, so, so using the player mask. Oh, and I, oh yeah, it's audio reactive too, which is why it's doing that. Because when I'm talking, it's, yeah, it's pulsing with me talking. Um, so in this particular example, it's using the audio reactive elements up here, which are driving our uh, transform. Just to show you guys weird creative stuff that you could do. And so we're using the mask to basically mask out the, um, the image. And through our feedback, um, so I added like an edge to it and some other things. So basically with this one, which works a lot better when I actually have the MIDI controller set up, but I've run out of USB B ports, um, then you can control it live and then use that to mask out people. So I'm kind of going in order of like the most basic stuff that you can do with Connect. So this is using the Connect top. So we're not using like any positional data or any joint data. Um, this is kind of like the entry point into how you can use the Connect for, for visual stuff. And so um, this would be more like a, a VJ perspective. So basically using the player, the image of a person as a mask to mask out um, another image of something. Um, when we get through the other ones, I can plug in my uh, MIDI controller because I do have it set up to control a bunch of stuff. So um, so that's how you would set up the, the player mask. Um, for the point cloud, We're just going to take a second to load. Mm -hmm. All right, so for with the point cloud, if it wants to respond. Oh, right, this one, did I not change it? I might show you guys this one separately because I was experimenting with something. So I'll talk over it while I was doing it. Um, so with the um, point cloud data, if we look at the um, depth camera, so basically with the, with the point cloud, uh, when we get the grayscale depth image from the connect, what it's doing is it's using the infrared light to detect the distance of objects in front of it. 
And so it gives us back a depth map image where um, objects that are uh, closer are going to be darker, which seems reverse, but um, closer objects are going to be darker and then further objects are going to be white. So you can see the um, board back there, the wall is going to be basically one of the lightest objects and then people in the foreground are going to be more grayscale. And so what you're going to do is basically use these values to map um, the Z information. So if you imagine, I'm going to talk through this and then hopefully be able to show you guys the example that I set up if it doesn't overload it. Um, so do you guys know how to do iterations in, in uh, iterations? No? OK, um, so I'll talk you guys through it. So if you have, let's say, a wall of cubes, right? Like, let's say, 1920 by 1080. So we have 19 cubes by 1080 cubes, so basically like a whole wall of cubes, right? So let's say that those cubes are in touch designer. And so presently, all of the cubes are in the same place, just like a flat wall, right? So if I wanted to offset them coming out of the wall, you know the, the pin press thing, right, that people have? Yeah, so exactly like that. So if I wanted to extrude, um, or not extrude, if I wanted to shift the distance outwards of those cubes based on this positional data, then what I would do is, since I have, I know white is the furthest away and then black is going to be closest, then I can use those values and basically I would just have to swap it so that the Z distance is the uh, point cloud information that I'm getting on a pixel by pixel basis. Um, so that's essentially what we're doing. Um, and I'm kind of coming back to the example because it chugged when I tried to open it up before because I was experimenting with something. Um, so let me just do it over here, actually. Uh, no, we'll come back to this one. Only because we're getting short on time um, and I might have to just make a separate video to send to you guys. Um, so that's the depth map one that we get. The um, infrared, oh, there you go. Okay, so the infrared is a camera image that is going to send the uh, infrared light basically straight from the connect. Um, sometimes you might use this for something, for example, like maybe as an alternate depth map because it's really good at isolating stuff. If you guys ever do an installation with a connect, a um, couple little tips on setting stuff up. So uh, depending on what you're doing, a lot of times you have to isolate the player from everything behind it. So for example, if you're just using the depth map, then if I do this, I'm going to pick up on every single thing that's in the image. So this board's going to be in that, uh, this, the cubes that we talked about, the board's going to be there. All this stuff's going to be there. There's no way for me to presently isolate a person from the rest of it. So you have to do additional processing. For example, like we talked about with the, um, the player mask. So because the player mask, actually, can I get somebody to volunteer to just kind of like stand in front of it? Thank you. And then we'll have an example of the player mask. So with the player mask, um, you can use it for the mask. And so if you wanted to use that to mask out the other image and then extrude the cubes, then you could isolate the player and do something like that. Um, the player index, the way that it works is it identifies figures, because that's what the Connect is basically good at doing, is figuring out uh, skeletons. It's like, OK, you have a full skeleton. Basically, you're a human. You have essentially a full skeleton. You're, I think you're a human. And so um, with the player index, you can use it for a mask, um, but it's also, if you need to do multiplayer stuff, um, if you're using the skeletal data, it can be a lot easier. But um, basically, the way that the player index is set up is the grayscale values are slightly different per player. Um, and so sometimes, depending on the installation that you're doing, um, if you have like a one player experience and then somebody else comes in front of the connect, that can cause issues sometimes because then if she leaves and then the second person is standing there trying to interact with it and you've said that it's one player only, then it won't recognize that person. So the first time that I did an installation where, you know, I was testing at home, worked great. Um, and then when I went to set it up, I literally had to have people stand behind a wall and say, like, do not enter this area. It's one player only and then go. And so obviously learned very quickly from that experience. Um, and so playing with multiplayer stuff, if you're using the,
Mm, yep. Oh, uh, six. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So you can set the number of players, like max number of players here, and it will give you, see, you have player one. For example, if you set more than that, then you'll have player two. So if you're doing multiplayer stuff, you can use that identification for the skeletal data to map stuff, um, depending on, on how you want to set up your installation. So at least the skeletal data will indicate which is player one and player two. But if you set it player one and then you have conflict with that, then sometimes you have to think about that ahead of time. Um, so let's see, infrared, and then we have our player index and then our point cloud. So the way that the point cloud is set up, um, thank you. <laughs> the way that the point cloud is set up is uh, basically it's an RGB image that is going to um, give us the depth information using red, green, and blue. So what that allows us to do, thinking in channels and breaking out different numbers and stuff. So um, the RGB is our X, Y, and Z. So three dimensions, three dimensions. So if you're working with this information, um, then you can pull out easily the red, green, and blue values because, or yeah, the red, green, and blue values because those are directly mapped to the X, Y, Z space. Um, so if we dive into that example is not working really well. Let's see if we can, oh. Okay, hold up your hands. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, it lost your hands. It was pulling them before. Hold on. I love how I tested all these examples and now none of them are. Let's see what it's actually following. Can you move your hand and see if this is actually you? Uh, barely. Do you mind standing up again? I think it's probably just the mapping range. Okay, so it is. Okay, yes, I think it is because you were under the table maybe. Okay, cool. So um, so for tracking <laughs> positional data and basically mapping, thank you, uh, geometry to the connect, um, what you're going to use is the skeletal data. And so for this, I just use the um, hand. Um, but we're using the U and the V instead of the X, Y, Z. And the reason being is because we're mapping it um, on top of an image. So because we're working in um, two-dimensional space and basically the U and the V because we're working with pixels. So I'm pulling out the U and the V um, instead of working with the, the X and the Y. Okay. And then um, with the map, the math bas basically, <laughs> sorry, just remapping it to the uh, image space. Um, and then merging the channels. And so finally, at the end, I have the location of the left and the right hand that has been um, mapped to the proper size of the image. And then that can track the position of the spheres. So basically, um, I have the circle and the circle, and those are set to an over. And so the position of the circle um, which is laid over the images in the background just so that we can see where it's actually moving. It thinks your leg is a hand. <laughs> it gets confused by tables sometimes because it kind of breaks up your skeleton. And so it doesn't think that that's a skeleton. I can turn on, actually, there is a seating option that might possibly help us in this scenario. Let's see, full interactions. Full seated. Let's see if it figures it out now. Didn't really help. All right, so um, yeah, it's not tracking it because you're sitting behind a table. Um, this is a super basic example that I'm showing you guys here, but the, the broader idea here is wanting to show you guys. So if you're working with dancers or if you're working with um, geometry that's going to be mapped to the position of where people are and you want them to be able to control it, um, then you're going to be working with the chop data, which tells you all the positions of the joints of people that are, are um, standing in front of the connect. And so you want to map that to geometry to be able to change the position. Okay. Um, and so you can do things like 
I think I had a simple example here. Geosphere. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you say that again? Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you repeat your question? Yeah, my question is like, when you have that on, you can see like the walls of the people around her. Well, for, for what you're doing, um, so so that was kind of starting with like the most basic things to do with Connect. So if you're doing the interactions, um, because that was pulling from a camera, um, if you're working with the skeletal data, then you wouldn't need to worry about that because you're pulling directly from the, the chops. So for example, we can, uh, let's expand on the object follow, for example. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn off Right. So it's like you can call it the foot is the way you're doing it, but then you can still kind of go with like the feet and the eyes. Do you think it was all kind of like Yeah, so yeah. Um so with that one that was using the uh, mat. So basically with the mat, um, and I added some other stuff, so it's really stylized right now. Um, um, so the mat itself is the, the player index. So it's going to pick up on when somebody's standing directly in front of the camera. It's a lot cleaner. Um, so it's going to pick up on the people that are standing in front of it, and then you basically, I adjusted the levels to get pure white and black. Um, I did a little processing to try and get a cleaner mat. Um, this is a, a little bit of a quicker method, um, but I just added a blur with it to kind of fill in some of the space and, and smooth out some of the edges. Um, and then that goes into, you can ignore that, that's the stylized part. Um, so that goes into my mat. So the way that the mat works is you have, um, the image that you want to be uh, masked, and then you have what you want it to be composited over, and then the last one is your your mask. Okay, so you can take the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's what I was kind of trying to mention earlier is um, like I've had to use that before with the uh, GLS. I was basically using um, the mask, which you can do it in different stages. So you don't necessarily need the GLSL. But um, yeah, you can use this uh, player index to mask the um, incoming RGB image. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no worries. I don't mind I'm repeating a lot of stuff. So, um, so yeah, with the, uh, since we're getting short on time, I'm debating um, if there's anything we should jump into instead of doing the connect stuff, because all the examples are going to be a little bit. Hold on, let me see what else we have. We did the OSC. Um, did anybody want to see really quickly the Ableton stuff? Nope. Ableton? OK. Um, so with Ableton, um, I have an example here. Let me go ahead and pull it up. So there's two main ways I wanted to show you guys to work with Ableton and Touch Designer. Um, especially now that you guys know OSC. So the first one that I recommend is um, called Live Grabber. 
And it is, I think I actually put a link in there for you guys. Yeah. So if you go inside of the uh, TD or sorry, the Ableton Live Grabber operator, and then there's the text file, it has the link. So if you. Pull that up. Um, so if how many of you guys have Ableton on your computers right now? Some people? OK. Um, so if you do, then here's where you get the uh, max for live plugin. And I'll walk through how to use it. So once you download the plugin, then it basically shows up as a, um, let me just search for it. put it in my plugins um, so live grabber and it comes with a bunch of different specialized tools and so um, the two that I'm going to go over are this and TD Ableton TD Ableton is super robust because it's basically the derivative team built it for working with touch designer and Ableton um, we will get into that but it's a lot of options. This is really good for basically if you just want to analyze audio signals in um, Ableton and then send that audio detection to Touch Designer. So the way that it works is um, I have just two sounds up here uh, just to play with. Um, so let's say that we have these two sounds playing. You can't hear. They're just going to be super loud. Okay, but you can see that they're playing down here. Um, so what I would do, I'll go ahead and delete this one. If I want to grab the levels of the individual uh, tracks, then I grab the analysis grabber, and I just put it on the track. And you can see down at the bottom is analyzing the uh, low, mids, and highs. And so if I look at this one at the response, so the mid's pretty good, high's pretty good, and eh, low's okay, but basically like either one of these. Let's say that I wanted to get the mid value. Over on the right side here, so this is the OSC that we just did. So um, I would select what kind of follower I want. So I'm gonna do the mid follower. And then I'm gonna change the address just to give it a name. Uh, I'll just call it the name of my track. So this one is on bass saw, I guess. So I'll just call it bass saw. Um, and then that's going to be what comes into Touch Designer. So it's good to give it a name. Um, the little yellow light means that it's registering information. Uh, but it's not going to send it until I actually create a sender. So on my master track, I'll just delete this really quick so we can start from scratch. Um, on my master track, I'm going to grab a grabber sender and put it there. And you can see it's actually giving me a, oh wait, that's not my master track, sorry. Let me delete that. Go to my master. Oh no, it is, okay. Let me delete that one. Um, and then put my grabber sender. And you can see, so it is creating data and my outgoing port, now that you guys know exactly how to set up OSC, um, by default is 1337. The target IP address, this uh, 127.0.0.1, that just means it's my local computer. So that's the IP address that just literally means local host, they're the same thing. Um, so it's sending internally on my computer to 1337. So if I go to Touch Designer, oh, I think I already put in, yeah, so I just kept the default. So if I create an OSC in, and then I set it to the port that Ableton is sending out of, through Live Grabber, then now I have the information coming in. Okay, so that's the, I have it set up on both of them because I did this previously. So on the um, Glass Kit track, I have my Analysis Grabber set up to send this message out. And I have this one also sending out. And then I have my Master Track with the uh, Grabber Sender. And then as long as you have the same port, then it's going to send it into Touch Designer. So once it's in Touch Designer, um, then you can take that data. And you can see I just mapped it really quickly for the example. And so uh, if we watch the levels, 
This one is going to go boop, and then that one's doing a few of them. So this one I have mapped to control, for our example, uh, this one is going out to, all right, um, that one's controlling the levels. I'm sorry, the switch. So this one is going to, basically this is the larger version of it. And so every time that the levels are high enough, it triggers the switch, which is then gonna go to the bigger version of it. So every time it goes, you can't hear it, but the little boop, then um, that tells the switch to switch to a bigger version of it to create emphasis impact. And then the other signal is going to my levels. Um, and so basically every time that the bass hits, then it's inverting it. So it's creating that uh, visual emphasis through inverting it to the, the white background. Right. So um, back with what we were talking about, basically any time that you're in the number domain. So since live is sending those levels with signals that we can then bring via OSC into Touch Designer. Um, then from there, you can process them any way that you want to control anything. So um, with this particular data, I just added a limit to it because sometimes the data comes in and it's not really the range that you want to work with. And so I added a limit to it, which if you're not familiar with, basically um, if you set a clamp, it will allow you to set a min and a max. So even if the values go way over that, if you set a limit, then it's going to limit that. So that can be helpful sometimes when you have data coming in that you don't want to completely blow out whatever you're controlling. Um, then you can set a, a limit, and then that will limit the range. Um, and then I adjusted the range of the values with the uh, math chop. The other one that I wanted to show you guys, um, which we won't dive too deep into just because it's a lot to set up and then um, there's different versions. So before we were trying to set it up before the um, the workshop and there is one element that I'll show you guys. So um, basically what you're gonna do with the uh, TD package, or sorry, the uh, TD Ableton. Um, inside the TD Ableton, not that one. Inside the uh, Ableton, TD Ableton component, um, I added a text file for you guys. Um, Derivative has a really nice documentation on setting it up. Um, the reason why we're not gonna go too much into it today is because it's actually quite a bit to set up and get working properly. But the thing about TD Ableton is it's extremely robust. So if you really wanna do synchronized um, songs controlling different things, triggers controlling different things within Ableton. Um, if you want to do more than just doing um, audio analysis in Ableton, controlling and triggering things in uh, Touch Designer, then TD Ableton is definitely gives you a ton of options for literally every process that's going on inside of um, Ableton. And so um, basically with this setup, what you have to do is there is a uh, TD Ableton component, which is the one that I added here, which is inside of the uh, panel, or sorry, the palette. So if you open up the palette and drag the TD Ableton, or sorry, click on TD Ableton and then drag this uh, TD Ableton package into your project. And I already have one there, so I'll delete that one. Oh, did you actually maybe connect? Um, and then uh, inside of live, what you're gonna do is um, go to your preferences and uh, under MIDI, you're gonna set to touch designer and you actually have to um, download some other stuff too. Um, so you have to, uh, copy this uh, touch designer programming scripts. So this is why I gave you guys this link um, because they did a really great job of documenting the process of setting it up. Um, but for diving into setting it up now, since half of you guys don't have Ableton, um, I don't want to go too deep into that right now. Um, but once you have it set up between touch designer and Ableton, then Ableton is going to communicate everything, all the processes that's happening to touch designer and that's gonna come in inside of the um, TD Ableton package. 
um, uh, like track information, uh, the uh, clock information, uh, the the MIDI, of course, the level. So pretty much almost like any data that's, that's happening. The uh, song information, uh, the length of the song. Let's see if it has it. Or... Yeah, like all of this data pretty much. And then even more if we go inside of, yeah. So um, this, to be honest, I haven't used as much as I would like to because a lot of times for the audio reactive and uh, audio analysis stuff that I do, Live Grabber is plenty for what I need. Um, yeah, it is. Um, but if you really, really want to sync uh, Touch Design on Ableton, I mean, this tool has so many options of what to work with. So, so Live Grabber is really great. Um, but this one is also really robust, especially um, if you can get it set up, which once it gets set up, it, it works great. But there is a little bit of a getting it set up process. So, yeah. Um, so we are just about at one o'clock. Um, are there any questions? Basically, I wanted today to be about broad spectrum and ideas. I know we went over like a ton of stuff rather than diving super deep into one particular thing. So did you guys find today helpful? Cool. Do you guys have some ideas for your own projects? Cool. Does anybody want to share their? Yeah. Um, so I would probably use uh, instancing with uh, GLSL to track that. Um, have you used GLSL before in Touch Designer? Uh huh. Yeah, um, it's definitely going to be quite involved and tricky. Um, there is an example of. Um, sorry, we didn't get a chance to go into all the examples, but um, there was the. Oh, let's go. Oh, uh, controlling the particles. So this one uh, kind of sets up the um, tracking the positional data of somebody and then using that to control particles. Um, so basically, um, this is kind of getting into what you're asking. And so with the particles, this is just using a particle system in Touch Designer. Um, but if you want to be able to keep track of how much they've accumulated, then you need to know uh, the instance number and like the, the actual count of the particles. Um, so that's why I was saying GLSL would be a good route to go because without doing that, then it, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that would be a good idea. Um, and then depending on kind of like the, the end goal, like if maybe the, the bracelet that you had, is it, um, is it just a sensor indicating that that person is in front of or in that vicinity or if it's actually communicating the data back to the bracelet? Yeah, you might want to look into like RFID, for example, is uh, set up to do that. So um, RFID, um, radio frequency ID. <laughs> um, so basically, I think that that would be a really good route to use because it would um, it has a decent enough distance that it would communicate that information. Um, and then you would be able to keep track of because then it would have a unique address per person. Yeah, instead of just relying on like, you look like a skeleton, you look like a skeleton, but I can't tell the difference between the two skeletons. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else wanna share their idea? <laughs> Do you have one that you want to tell us about? Oh, that's right, you weren't here for that. Oh, at the beginning or like midway through, um, everybody thought of an example of a project that they wanna apply yeah, like what you would want to apply it to. Yeah, we basically just like talked about uh, like if you could imagine a project, like where would it be? What kind of um, like physical gestures would you do? Is it you controlling it or is it somebody else controlling it? Are you, uh, you know, creating something for like a band or a client or is it you doing a live performance and thinking about a specific project and figuring out the pipeline? So do you have an idea now how to make that, how to put it together? Cool. 
yeah, there's a lot that you can do with it, um, for sure. That's why I was trying to show in the examples, like depending on what data you're working with, there's there's all different approaches of how to work with it. So, yeah, there's um different things you can look into. Like uh, when I was doing spatialized audio for the dome, there's uh, Max for Live plugins. Uh, like we used uh, Spot Gree, S P A T G R I S, and there's a couple others that are um, S P A T. Uh, G R I S. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them are specifically for dome, but it's the same idea of, um, spatialized audio where basically some of them, a lot of them have a visual interface where you're mapping visually like the X and Y similar to the, the X and the Y controller on, on, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And because, yeah, and so because the sound and the object would be the same position, then you would use the same data to control the same thing. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we can do one more, and then I think we have to, hello? Did you want to share yours? Um, so you could use something like the Connect or something that has infrared. It doesn't necessarily have to be the Connect, but if you're tracking, um, unless you had something on them that was sending out, a signal that, that was registering. Um, the connect or something similar to that would be good for registering positional data. Um, but going back to when you were talking about, for example, like using other sensors along with registering position. So it might be interesting to rethink it in terms of something a little bit more accurate so that people have something specific to them. Um, yeah. There's a couple different ways that you can do it. Um, let me go ahead and I'm going to make some finishing remarks and wrap it up. And then I can definitely talk more about that. Um, yeah, because I, I think it's a really cool idea. There's like several different ways that you could approach it, though. Um, but really quick, I was going to say um, some other things that I brought. Um, so talking about the three-dimensional space. Uh, so there's also 3D mouses, mice, uh, <laughs> if you guys uh, ever wanted to try that. So uh, basically, they're created for navigating three-dimensional space, like in a um, 3D software, for example. Um, do I have mine plugged in? Oh, yeah, I do. Uh, so <laughs> you can see um, I am navigating Touch Designer with this 3D mouse now, and it's moving around. Um, so the fun thing about it, I actually just started using it about a week ago, and I have not figured out how to have it not control touch there because I want to control the visuals but not be doing this every time I try to control the visuals. So um, the way to fix that currently is basically just if I open a view menu, I don't think I have this one set up for 3D. No, I don't have this one set up for 3D. But if I open a view menu and then um, move the mouse on top of it, then it will respond to the mouse and it will not move touch designer. And so um, since this is three-dimensional, then similar to what we were talking about with the Mimu gloves in three-dimensional space and the leap motion in three-dimensional space, so I can navigate the um, XYZ axis or the XYZ rotation to control, for example, the uh, camera that's moving around in touch designer in, in three-dimensional space. So um, for example, I used it uh, last night, I VJ'd it sat in the dome. And so I had some visuals where I was navigating the camera using the mouse. And so I could actually use it to control the three-dimensional space. So if you guys are looking for adding a dimension to your navigation, then uh, 3D mouse is another option. Um, there's also, oh, basically, um, so really quickly, if you wanted to add that, it's under the uh, joystick chop. I don't know if you guys knew that the joystick chop exists, but it does. Um, so that's another way of interfacing with controllers. Um, another thing I'm experimenting with right now uh, this week is using the um, Wii remote, basically, because it already has sensors in it and it has buttons. So pretty much anything, if you can get it to communicate with Touch Designer, whether it's sending OC or through other hacks to get into the data that the sensors are sending, um, then you can find ways to use that with Touch Designer. So um, the Wii remote uh, I'm going to be playing with this week. And then uh, the Vive controllers also work. So Vive, the, the VR is actually really easy um, through using the open VR. Right? Yeah, open VR. Um, so this I've been playing with uh, last week for a project for a client. And so uh, basically using the controllers to be able to navigate space. And because they have buttons and other things, then it works great because um, like we talked about with uh, activating things. So when they push a button, then they can uh, control spatially 
like stretching things and then they let go and then it stays there. So it's a really cool way to uh, navigate space. So, um, don't know, maybe <laughs> I haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah. So, so literally anything that sends data, um, the trick is just figuring out how to get to that data and get into, um, touch designer. But since it's numbers and numbers, then you're good once you get it going. Um, let me answer that question. Um, I'm going to. All right. So thank you very much for coming, guys. I hope you guys learned a lot. And I look forward to seeing what you guys do with it. So.